Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Steve Blank. Come, Steve. Steve Blank is a serial entrepreneur. He's uh, lecturing at, the, at Stanford, at the engineering school at Stanford, yep. at Berkeley, at the business school at Berkeley, and at the business school at Columbia University. He is a longtime Silicon Valley denizen. He is into computer history. He was a marketing guru. That's how I met him at the previous company where I worked at Epiphany. And he's here to give a talk which I think will tie nicely into Tom Perkins's talk, which was given a couple of weeks ago. And I don't know whether you have been to that one or not, Tom Perkins of the KPCB fame. And he talked a lot about uh, Bill and Dave Packard and uh, his uh, relationship with them and uh, them being a mentor to him. And he touched uh, on a lot of Silicon Valley history. But uh, I thought uh, Steve Blank's talk will open this uh, a lot more. I've seen this talk uh, a while ago, and uh, I can tell you it's really interesting. Steve, please, uh, please give Steve a warm welcome. Thanks, Paul. So uh, I appreciate uh, being here at the center of the universe. And uh, as uh, Bars pointed out, uh, I do drive-by teaching in uh, a number of universities, uh, which is what you do uh, when you actually cash your Google stock when it crosses 1,000. Um, so the talk today is hidden in plain sight. It's the secret history of Silicon Valley. And a few caveats about the talk. I'm not a professional historian. Uh, some of this, uh, hopefully not all of it, is probably wrong. And all the secrets uh, I'm going to share with you are from open source literature. Um, I find uh, history, uh, particularly history of the valley, uh, kind of interesting because you could never tell where you're going uh, unless you know where you've been. And the valley uh, has several waves of innovation, uh, the defense wave, integrated circuit wave, personal computer wave, internet wave. And it doesn't mean that every one of these waves meant everybody in the valley was just doing this. But it meant at that period of time, there was a core concentration of expertise in Silicon Valley, in this local area, on each one of these domains. And what I want to talk about today briefly is an area you probably know very little about, and that's the area about defense. Silicon Valley was, and in some cases still is, the heart and mind of NSA CIA innovation. And I'm going to illustrate this with five very short stories. The first story is about World War II. And the surprise to me is the title. World War II is the first electronic war. How many of you uh, have ever seen World War II movies? Anybody? OK. Planes, bombers. Anybody see you know, Air Force movies in World War II? Every movie you've ever seen about World War II that involved bombers were wrong. Every one of them. Not because people were lying, but simply that the directors and the screenwriters don't know and still don't know what I'm about to tell you today. Just to set the scene, in September 1939, World War II started in Europe. And by the summer of 1940, the Germans had overrun continental Europe. They owned everything from the English Channel, and they were moving, starting in June 1941, into Western Russia. Britain stood alone. And by December 1941, when Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, the US joined them. But the only way to affect German power in Europe in 1941 two, three, and half in 1944 was to start a strategic bombing campaign to destroy the industrial capacity of Germany. And this was called the Combined Bomber Offensive. British planes and then American planes took off every day to fly from Britain to industrial targets over Germany. The British bombed with four-engine bombers called Lanchesters and Halifaxes. They bombed at night. 
Their goal was what they called area bombing, or euphemistically to de-house the population. <laughs> Unfortunately, if you were in the house, they also had some other effects on you. But since they couldn't barely see what they were bombing at, this was carpet bombing of cities. These planes flew at 17, excuse me, at seven to 17,000 feet, carried up to 20,000 pounds of bombs, round trip from Germany, from Britain to Germany to back. And starting in late 1942, and really getting into it in 1943, the Americans started bombing. And their concept was, we're Americans. Hey, we could put these bombs down a smokestack. This is precision bombing. We're going to take out specific industrial targets. And we used B-17s, which you see here, and B-24s. And these bombers flew somewhere between 15 and 25,000 feet. These planes were unpressurized. Pi uh, pilots and crew were on oxygen for six to eight hours per mission. You'll see some pictures of that in a second. The goal was to do destroy the transportation in infrastructure, the petroleum and fuel oils infrastructure, aircraft infrastructure, and anything else that contributed to the German war economy. Let me uh, just put this in context about the size of this air struggle. This wasn't Moffett Field, a couple planes a day. The size of the Allied air war in Europe was a titanic struggle, the likes of which we'll never see again with manned aircraft. There were 20,000, excuse me, 28,000 Allied airplanes at its peak, bombers and fighters. 40,000 planes were lost and destroyed. 40,000. Just in context, the entire jet fleet, Boeing, Airbus, smaller manufacturers today in operation, 15,000 planes worldwide. We lost 40,000 of them in Europe. And just for scale, 160,000 airmen died over Europe. Not got shot down, just died. Half US, half British, and by the way, they were your age. They were all in their early 20s. That's who manned these crews. Let me give you an example. We got the audio. Navigator, do you estimate we've crossed the enemy coast? Notice yes, the oxygen sir. mask. We sure have. Those little black dots are not new clouds. <laughs> Those little black dots are something called flak or anti-aircraft shells bursting around the aircraft. A couple of things to note. Crew, pilot, co-pilot, navigator, radio operator, bombardier, and lots of gunners who you'll meet in a second. As soon as they took off from Britain, they were facing the German air defense system. And here's the stuff no movie maker ever knew. The Germans in 1940 set up the Kammugel line. It was an integrated electronic air defense network. It stretched from northern France all the way into Germany. Its job was to defend Germany from British and US bomber raids, to warn and detect German air defense, to target and aim their weapons, and then destroy the bombers before they got to the targets. The Germans could see the British and American planes forming up 200 miles away. These were the air defense radar sites in occupied France. And the air defense radars had 200 mile ranges. The first phased array radar ever built was the Mammoth. Peak power, 200 kilowatts, 100 feet across. But the backbone of early warning radar for the Germans was a steerable tower, actually pivoted, 190 feet high, almost a megawatt. And we're talking about 1942. 150 of these spread across occupied France. Now, once these bombers were detected in formation, and they started flying, if you remember that video, have we crossed the coast? What they encountered 
was something called the Himmelwelt, which was the German air defense network, which was local air defense organized by 30 by 20 mile boxes. And each one of those boxes had an integrated network of radars, FLAC, which was a German name for anti-aircraft guns, fighters, and for nighttime, searchlights. And what happened was, as bombers started entering the Himmel Belt, they were detected by the FREA early warning radars. That provided warning through a command center that started vectoring or talking pilots of German fighter planes into the bomber stream. And this ground controlled intercept technique was invented in Germany right here and directed fighters right into the bombers. And then the fighters, particularly at night, for the first time, had their own onboard radar. German fighter planes had radar that when they got into the vicinity could lock on to the bombers and target their weapons. The FREA, which was this local defense radar, 90 mile range, giant Würzburg, 1,500 of these were deployed in these Himmel belt cells, 45 uh, mile range. This thing is 25 feet across, or 150 of these. And all this data for these Himmel belts were pouring into air traffic control centers. They didn't call them that, but that's what you should think about them. All the radar data from these short range radars, all the long range radar data, and they even had their equivalent to the National Security Agency who was picking up passive detection of picking up all the radio traffic from the bombers as they formed up. All came into these centers where they integrated all this data. And think of a giant movie theater. And you had fighter controllers looking at a giant map projected on a screen with the controllers sitting in theater-like seats. And they would talk the fighters into the vicinity of the targets. The fighters would turn on their radar and acquire and attack the target. At night, when the British were bombing, the German night fighters would use their radar. And it looked like this. I hadn't figured out this time in the war that, gee, you could put a radome that is a covering around these things that would be transparent to radar. So these things looked like um, deer and, uh, horns. But they were pretty effective. But the weak link was the ground controller communications channel. We'll talk later about what could happen if you could shut that down. These were the planes that were used for night attack. During the day, ground control intercept just had to get these fighters into the general range. And then you could eyeball the bomber stream. Kind of hard to miss a 1,000 bombers heading for Berlin once you got into the general area. Again, the weak, weak link was the controller communications channel. Typical planes were the Messerschmitt BF-109 and the Falkwolf uh, 190. Uh, yes? Great question. So um, if you're, a, uh, if you're uh, flying during the day, you were vectored. Um, if you were flying at night, you used your radar. And I'll show you some more, another example. Uh, typically, that's where the bombers would hide, but eventually they had to come out if they wanted to bomb. So I'll show you an example. Heads up, everybody. The black sprint. Look out for fighters. Here's an, an example of a fighter attack. This is real footage from World War II. Block them coming up on the other side. On the interphone, be specific. How many? Where? 11 FWs, 3 o'clock. On your toes, high squadron, low squadron, here they come. 12 o'clock high. Watch it, Cobb. They're heading for the high squadron. Formation, so they're 
guns would overlap each other uh, to provide some sort of protection. They didn't have escorts till late in the war when the P-51, which actually changed the tide of the bombing war, allowed uh, uh, the bombers to have sufficient range to take them all the, all the way to the target. Um, in 1941, 42, 43, beginning of 44, uh, there wasn't uh, adequate fighter protection. And when they started using fighters, P-47 didn't have enough range uh, to take them all the way into Germany. A um, couple things to note. About 60% of bomber losses were to fighters. About 40% were lost to something called, which I mentioned earlier, anti-aircraft uh, or flak. The Germans had 5,000 anti-aircraft radars. If you ever see pictures of anti-aircraft guns shooting, you never once see the fact that they were all radar directed. Holy cow. Um, and the guns they used, think of cannons pointing up in the air. The shells were fused for time. They were fragmentation rounds. Shell went off if you were within 50 feet of that shell. Your plane was peppered by shrapnel, and the odds are you, you were going to uh, get severely damaged or go down. The good thing for the Allies, I'll take this as questions if anybody's interested, the Germans never had proximity fuses. Um, could have dramatically changed the result of the air war. Also, Germans had designed a pretty effective prototype of a surface-to-air missile called the Wasserfall, but they also didn't do that. They put all their resources into the uh, V-2, which, while great for rocket science, uh, was her pretty ineffective as a strategic weapon. Next thing was the bomb run. They fought their way over Europe. They're getting to the target, and they're about to line up to bomb. Run from house to Acknowledge. Charlie Leader, Wilco, Baker Leader to Able Leader. We'll be bombing in a bad crosswind. Second See all the flaps bursting there. around them. Able to Baker, no dice will hit the primary. Repeat, your new IP is how stupid. Roger. So, okay, they're about to make their bomb run, and somebody said about clouds. Um, there's only four clear days a month in fall and winter over Europe. Great photos, shows a nice day. How'd they see the target? Here's the other piece you never saw in any war movie about World War II. They show the bombardier using an optical bomb site. Works great when it's clear. It's optical. How do you bomb through a cloud? Great weather. By the way, that's flak. Dropping their bombs on a target. Oh, perfect aim. Uh, by the way, only about 30% of bombs, even at the end of the war, came within a half a mile of the target. Precision bombing uh, uh, was an oxymoron. So what they finally decided to do and invented and installed by 1943 was air-to-ground radar. By the end of the war, every US and, US and British bomber had a bombing radar set. It meant for the first time they no longer needed to cancel missions when it was overcast over the target. These were pretty primitive, and all they did was paint an outline of kind of the major ground features. But it was good enough to develop map overlays to say, well, if you see a feature that looks like that, it's probably Hamburg. And so targets could be, or Berlin, or maybe it's hopefully not London. Um, targets could be seen under the cloud and the rain. The British installed this in mid-1943. The Americans took it and improved it a bit and put it in mass production on every British and American bomber. This will come back in another story a little later on. Now, Supposedly, this story and this talk is about the secret history of Silicon Valley. Well, this might be amusing and interesting. What the heck does World War II have to do with Silicon Valley? So let me just remind you about what's going on here. Horrific casualties. Google Math Challenge. For every 100 bombers on a mission, each mission, 
4 to 20% wouldn't return. Holy cow, they're your age. And you had to fly 25 missions to go home. Sobering. It was a priority to defeat German air defense system. Air defense system at its core was electronic. So story two was the development of an electronic shield in the middle of World War II called electronic warfare. And it was run by the most secret lab you've probably never heard of called the Harvard Radio Research Lab, which was in Harvard. But it was a code name for the US countermeasures. And its goal was to reduce losses to fighters and flak. And it did it with a couple ways. First, the Germans didn't publish any papers on their radar. <laughs> There's no open source literature. Google wasn't around. So the first one was we needed to gather electronic intelligence and signals intelligence about the characteristics of these signals. Then we needed to develop devices to jam and confuse those radars. This was a top secret 800 person lab. The first thing to find and understand German air defense, we took a couple of bombers and stripped all the bombs and racks and everything you could imagine out of them and packed them full of radar receivers, developed special purpose receivers that could go from 50 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. This is 1942. And flew these planes unarmed over Germany and recorded radar signals. Try to figure out frequency, power, pulse rate, etc. Once we understood that, we came up with some defenses. And the first one, believe it or not, was mechanical, not electronic. It turns out if you cut pieces of reflective material, and I don't mean optically reflective, I mean radar reflective, to half the frequency of that radar, it would get false returns. You could jam the radar by throwing tinfoil out the back of a plane. The British called it window. We called it chaff. We used this to disrupt the German air defense by jamming the Wurzburg frequencies for both ground control intercept and radar guided anti aircraft. It was first used over a city called Hamburg. And the first time this happened, we completely shut down the entire German air defense system. And it happened to be timed with a 1,000 bomber raid, which used incendiaries for the first time to try to destroy a complete German city. Some of you might know the results over Hamburg. In this first attempt, the crews literally opened the door and manually tossed out packets of chaff. Automatic dispensers became later. This was so important during the war, it used three quarters of all aluminum foil in the United States disappeared. No one understood why we're having an aluminum drive. It's for chaff. <laughs> but then this Harvard Radio Research Lab started earning their money. They systematically said, we're going to shut down every electronic component of German air defense. We're going to start by jamming the, those early warning radars. And we're going to put jammers on airplanes and blind the washermen's, mammoths, and freers. And they built jammers to do that first on escort fighters that flew along with the bombers. And then, when there were enough of these devices, it went on every bomber. Next thing was, let's jam the German anti-aircraft raider, the Wurzburgs. We're going to shut down the flak. We built 24,000 of these jammers, put them on all the bombers. And then, for the British at night, we need to jam the airborne radar on the fighters. And they built a set of devices to do that, not only to jam the fighter radar, but to jam the communications link between that fighter and its controller trying to vector them in. Now, this was great. It was on all British bombers. By the end of the war in 1944 and 1945, a bomber stream had an integrated electronic defensive system that flew along with it. It had chaff. It had electronic intelligence planes making sure there were no new German signals coming up or other radars. We were jamming the ground control intercept signals. And we were doing jamming against the AAA 
And all this was integrated not only in the planes itself, but by this time there were dedicated planes that had nothing, nothing, no bombs, but racks full of jammers flying along with every bomber mission. Now, this is pretty important. An integral part of the World War II war effort, you never heard about it. So who ran the secret lab and became the father of electronic warfare? And what the heck does this still have to do with Silicon Valley? Because the Harvard Radio Research Lab, which was the spin out of the MIT Radiation Lab, had 800 people. It wasn't like five guys that never heard of it. 800 people. The guy who ran it was Fred Terman of Stanford. Any of you from Stanford? Anybody? Anybody ever see this Terman Engineering Building? It's where my office is. Fred Terman, if you do know about him, is known as the father of Silicon Valley, but not because of, he was the father of electronic warfare. He was known as the kindly professor who encouraged his students, Bill Hewitt and David Packard, to start a company. That's what Fred Terman is known for in Valley lore. And for those of us in the black world, we kind of laugh, because that's not who Fred Terman really was. Fred Terman was the father of the military industrial complex in Silicon Valley. He was Dean of Engineering in 1946, and he was Provost in 1955. I want to talk about what happened in the Valley when Fred Terman came back from World War II knowing what he knew and knowing what he did. Just for some history, in World War II, the Office of Scientific Research and Development enlisted university research in helping win the war. It was the first time the military said, no, 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 we're not going to use our own labs to do advanced R&D, though we will. We're going to enlist all society, including university labs. And we're going to give out serious bucks for the first time to do this. $450 million was spent on weapons R&D, a good chunk of it with the universities. MIT got $117 million, Caltech 83, Harvard and Columbia 30, dramatically changed the direction and velocity of those universities. Oh, and by the way, Stanford got 50 grand. <laughs> 50 grand. Terman was so pissed, he packed up, and his old PhD advisor, Vannevar Bush, recruited him to head up the Harvard Radio Research Lab. Terman says, when he returns, this will never happen to Stanford again. His post-war strategy is to make Stanford a center of excellence for microwaves and electronics. Klystrons, traveling wave tubes, etc. And he's going to build Stanford with the MIT, not Harvard model, of military university collaboration from day one. Not going to be left out of the gravy train again. So Terman, being smart, said, hey, I had the world's best people in high power microwaves, radar, advanced electronics paid for by the military sitting at Harvard. How can I get them at Stanford? Eleven of them now become faculty members. Pretty cute idea. He reassembles essentially the radio research lab, cream of the crop, at Stanford as faculty. And he sets up the Erect Electronic Research Laboratory, ERL, as part of the engineering department, and for the first four years works on basic and unclassified research. Very benign, great idea. And got the first Office of Naval Research contract in 1946. ONR was the only um, part of the military even interested in continuing military R&D. By 1950, Terman turns Stanford's electronics department into the MIT of the West. Well known, really impressive. But the Korean War came. I don't know if any of you read history, but the Soviet Union was our ally in World War II. And after the war ended, things went bad pretty quickly. We thought we had a nuclear monopoly. The Soviet Union detonated its first atomic weapon in 1949. They took over Eastern Europe, and the Iron Curtain came down pretty fast. And from what became our ally, very quickly became a not only threat, but a nuclear arm threat. 
looked like communism was the winning bet. And then in 1951, North Korea invades South Korea. We join it yet again another war. We saw communist conspiracy everywhere. And the Korean War truly changed the game, not only for the country's thinking, but for Terman's thinking as well. Spook work comes to Stanford. Terman sets up a classified department at Stanford, the Applied Electronics Lab, and doubles the size of the electronics program, says, no, no, this will be separate from the unclassified work, but it made for the first time the university a full partner in this military industrial complex. We were doing serious weapons research at Stanford. Everything we knew in World War II, we're doing, but we're doing it more. Just to give you a context, this was paranoia time and probably not unrealistically. The Cold War battlefield moved from Germany to 500 miles to the east. Somebody's probably pointing out their hometown next to the ICBM site. Um, <laughs> there was a real fear this time of a nuclear Pearl Harbor because the Soviet Union was a closed country. Electronic countermeasures, electronic intelligence, signal intelligence all become critical, and that's what Stanford's expertise was known for, for its customers. The National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the arms of the military. This Cold War is an electronic war. This Russian air defense system that they set up is Germany times 10. Because not only are there fighters and anti-aircraft guns, but they start building surface-to-air missiles. They start adding sophisticated radar to not only their night fighters, but their day fighters. So the big job was, how do you understand the radar order of battle in the Soviet Union? And now, they don't have V2s. They're starting to build intercontinental ballistic missiles. How can we monitor the telemetry that they put on all their test missiles and figure out its performance? How do we do photo reconnaissance to find out where the missile silos are? And how do we monitor their growing Navy? And even more so, how do we even identify where their production facilities are and production capabilities for their nuclear weapons? All this required not only photo evidence, but required electronic and signals intelligence. So Stanford throws its hat in, joins the black world. Terman decides to take the electronics research lab, which did basic and unclassified research, and the applied laboratory, which did classified research and gave up and merged them both. Stanford in 1955 set up the systems engineering lab and became the most advanced signals intelligence, telemetry intelligence facility for its government customers. Now, in the context of the time, I, I, I'm not making any um, moral or value judgments about whether this is good or bad, but I will tell you the thing that Terman was doing at the same time, which changed all your lives which is why you're here. He did something, I don't think he gets any credit for it at all. And he changed the rules in how startups and universities work together. He was the first engineering dean and provost to encourage and almost throw out graduate students to start companies here in Silicon Valley. He encourages professors to consult for those companies. And he encouraged professors to take board seats, advisory board roles, anything you can to help new nascent startups. And he made it easy to walk out of Stanford with all this technology, like some other companies we might know, uh, with incredibly easy terms. And in fact, at Stanford, getting out into the real world was good for your academic career rather than bad. Contrast this to any other environment in the mid-1950s. Now, back to the war, the Cold War. Stanford was helping the military understand the electronic order of battle. We believed our bombers were going to have to one day penetrate the Soviet Union. And just like everything we learned about 
doing that over occupied Europe, we're going to have to relearn again. Where are the radars? The Strategic Air Command needed to know, and the CIA needed to know for a reason I'll show you in a second. What were the technical details of those radars? The NSA and CIA needed to give that detail to their contractors to build jammers. The periphery, that is the outside of the Soviet Union, its radar order of battle was somewhat known because you could fly a plane right to the Soviet border, radars would turn on, fighters would come out, and you would know, yep, there are radars there, they're trying to kill us. But you had no idea what was going on inside the middle of the country. This wasn't an academic exercise. Over 23 planes were shot down in the middle of the Cold War, all of them electronic intelligence gathering planes that flew along the periphery of the Soviet Union trying to record and identify the early warning radars that bombers would first see. Over 200 US citizens were shot down, some of them interred and never interned and never released. This was a hot, cold war. Now, some of you might have heard of a plane called the U-2. Anybody hear of that airplane? Now, any time I heard of the U-2, I saw those great photos, and the U-2, that was a photo plane. Turns out, by weight, most of the payload was electronic intelligence gathering equipment. But till today, you'll never read about that, about the U-2 payload being ELINT. It was all about cameras. Turns out, yes, we were trying to take pictures, but more so, we were trying to understand across the interior of the Soviet Union, what was the electronic order of battle. And the equipment that did that was courtesy of Stanford and Silicon Valley, a system that went from 150, to 40, 150 megahertz to 40 gigahertz, Stanford Electronics Lab, jammers to keep um, surface-to-air missiles away, Granger Associates, Watkins Johnsons, um, et cetera. The U-2s were jam-packed with ELINT receivers. Now, what's interesting was the innovation that came out of this. Just a side story. In 1960, at what was then Cape Canaveral, the Air Force was launching a rocket. And they noticed that radar signals from a radar that had nothing to do with this test somehow was bouncing off this missile when it was in the air and was picked up by another radar, two separate radars. Transmitter, receiver, completely separate, happened to be bouncing off an ICBM as it was being tested. And it was, they said, huh, this is kind of interesting. And they basically came up with the idea of a bi-static intercept receiver. That is, let's use a separate transmitter and receiver and a non-cooperating thing in the middle. And they said, where on earth could we actually use this to get some more information about radars in the middle of the Soviet Union. So Project Melody was born. And it turns out the Soviets were testing their ICBMs in the southwest corner of, of Soviet Union. So we used their missiles as they were launched to pick up the radar transmissions of their radars inside the Soviet Union and receive them in our receiving stations in Iran. It produced intercepts of all the Soviet ground-based missile tracking radars, including ABM radars uh, and uh, uh, ballistic missile radars we had no idea existed. Somebody got a medal for this one. The other thing we were building at the time after the U-2 was another intelligence platform called the Oxcarter A-12. It was the U-2 successor. The public uh, name for this was the SR-71. Now, this was a CIA plane. And the CIA was really concerned about how vulnerable this plane might be at high altitude, because it was designed to fly at above 80,000 feet at Mach 3. And it realized from the time it designed it to the time it was thinking about flying it over the Soviet Union that the Soviet air defense system had gotten really <coughs> dense. So the ELIN staff office at the CIA said, what's the radar environment like inside the Soviet Union? And they needed to find information about a radar called Tall King. It was the primary Soviet air defense radar, 100 feet wide, 
range 375 miles. And we were interested on where they were located. B-52 bombers needed to know. This A-12 ox card plane needed to know. The problem with signal intelligence, of course, it's all line of sight. The radar was inside Soviet Union, and none of our Eland aircraft could get high enough to pick up the signals. So what we decided to do was to use the moon. We're going to use the moon as a bi-static reflector. And we're going to listen for tall king signals as the Earth revolved and rotated around. And the alignment happened like an hour or two a month. But if you had multiple big radar dishes, you actually could start plotting the position of tall king radars. And it turns out this was tested in New Jersey at Bell Labs. And they said, late 1950s, holy cow, this really works, but we don't have enough geographic separation. We need more big dishes. Big dish. <laughs> big dishes all of a sudden get funded in the late 50s. Pay for and develop the Stanford dish. Hide the relationships through cover agencies. All you needed was access to the dish about an hour or two a month. Oh, we have some researchers coming in. Don't worry. And they didn't. They didn't take up much time. And this only lasted four or five years until we put other systems in place. But all the dishes that happened to get funded, you think we were really interested in radio astronomy in that order of magnitude? And we even built a bigger one at Sugar Grove in Virginia, a steerable uh, dish. And the Journal Bank dish in the UK all of a sudden got funded as well. Um, so we finally figured out where the tall kings were. But one of the things we were interested in was now that we know where they are, we need to know more stuff about them for jamming and stealth. So the solution for this was to build a fleet of electronic intelligence planes that literally, once in air, unspooled antennas that were miles long. I'm talking about miles. Flew around the periphery of the Soviet Union, uh, measured the Soviet air defense, and basically said, holy cow, these guys are pretty good. And it changed the Strategic Air Command uh, integrated operating plan, so B-52s, which had been designed to fly in at you know, high altitudes, now had to go in at 200 feet. Completely changed the nature of uh, one of our strategic triads. And finally, uh, there was something called Project Palladium. It said, OK, we know how good their, well, all this other stuff is, but we need to know how sensitive the equipment is and how good are their operators. And so what the, we built was a system here in Silicon Valley, company to be unnamed, um, that electronically generated false targets into the Soviet radars. They saw a ghost aircraft. And we could simulate any aircraft, any speed. And the trick, though, is to know what were they seeing. So we teamed with uh, the National Security Agency to listen to the communications channels of the radar operators while we were injecting false signals. And so we could decrypt them in real time. Thank you, National Semiconductor, which will this is another story. Uh, and watch when they turned on their tracking radars. Uh, and we used ground, um, base, uh, ground bases, naval ships, submarines. Uh, and this lasted about three years, gathered enormous data on the sensitivity of the Soviet air defense system. Finally, we had satellites. One of the first satellites we put in space was an electronic intelligence satellite, Project Grab. All of a sudden, we no longer needed to use the moon. We can just now use a satellite going around, collect radar emissions from Soviet air defense radars when it got over uh, a ground station, dump out uh, position, latitude, frequency, et cetera, built by the Naval Research Laboratory and used uh, by Strategic Air Command. Then the Navy put some stuff in space, except this time it wasn't one satellite. They put a whole cloud of them up and allowed them to direction find on radio and radar signals that Soviet ships were using in the middle of the ocean. Now, for the first time, you couldn't hide anywhere in the ocean. Clusters of sat satellites triangulated and direction find. What does this have to do with Silicon Valley? And as an example, just of one of the contractors, many that exist in this valley. Sylvania, who you might think of as being a light bulb manufacturer, was the second largest employer in Silicon Valley in the late 1950s. 
they ran the Electronics Defense Laboratory, which was basically an electronic countermeasures lab. Terman was a consultant, half the professors in the electronic labs were consultants. Um, 1,300 employees, big deal. But the bigger deal is in 1964, their director thought it was the world's biggest bureaucracy and quit and founded a company called ESL. Anybody know what happened to Bill Perry? Father of stealth, became the Secretary of Defense. Right? Biggest spook in Silicon Valley, father of stealth, direct descendant of Terman in terms of uh, military industrial relationships. Terman's legacy is the father of the relationship between the university and the military, began and institutionalized black Silicon Valley, ESL, Lockheed, GTL, Sylvania, uh, Argo. The university is a hand-in-hand -hand collaborator, collaborator with startups is probably his most lasting legacy. But the black version of what he did is completely missing from any of his histories or biographies. You'll never see anybody talk about what Terman did at all post-World War II. And, but the good stuff, the stuff that's lasting, the stuff that in fact makes us all here today, is he developed this model for university and entrepreneurial partnerships, consulting, patents, intellectual property, this notion of equity. All came from Terman, a really unique guy. Now, normally I would end the story right here, but I thought I'd tell you story five for two minutes. Unintended consequences. Uh, university and industry relationships are the most visible part of his legacy. Uh, and the deep and pervasive uh, university intelligence relationships are his secret legacy. But remember, what did Terman think the value was going to turn out to be? Anybody remember what he th said it was? Yeah, it was military, klystrons, microwaves, electronics. We're not the microwave valley, are we? How come? And here's why it's Silicon Valley. On the other side of town, the head of radar bombing training from the Air Force starts a company. Remember um, these guys? Before you now is the radar scope, a small circular screen giving x-ray-like vision to the mysterious 11th member of the crew. This is a World War II the radar uh, uh, bombing radar video. Until recently, we've known little of what he does and even less about the instruments he uses. Basically, radar equipment consists of a radio transmitter and receiver. The transmitter sends a radio beam earthward. If it strikes water, the beam is not reflected. The receiver picks up nothing, and the scope appears dark, as it is now over the Pacific Ocean. But if the beam strikes a solid object, such as land, it's reflected and shows light on the scope. Watch. Something's coming in now at the upper left. Adjusting the receiver control sharpens the picture. There they are, two islands, both with mountains on them. That should make them easy to identify. It's Hawaii. Now, um, turns out that this was really hard to do, that is to pick up these signals and figure out what land masses there were. It was so hard, the Air Force put the, or Army Air Force put together a training group to build map overlays. And there was one guy who was responsible for all this in World War II. This is the guy who started a company. At the same time, Terman's working on all these black projects. He was also director of the Navy anti-submarine warfare operations at Columbia. Head of the radar bombing training for the Air Force. Anybody know who this guy is? He was deputy director of all of weapon systems and valuation. He was helping us build ICBMs. He was the deputy director. Who's this guy? He's a co-inventor of the transistor, and he found his Shockley semiconductor. It's William Shockley, father of Silicon Valley. William Shockley is the reason why we have all these semiconductor companies in Silicon Valley. He was a great a researcher, awesome talent spotter, and the worst manager probably on the planet. Unintended consequences? He hires the world's best team, and eight of them leave two years later, including Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore. And this group of eight found Fairchild Semiconductor, which then becomes the father of almost every other 
chip company in Silicon Valley. By the way, his beliefs about eugenics just effectively end any type of commercial career in 1963. But what he did for semiconductors, basically, he's at the root. All flowed from him. And Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley because of the guy who did radar bombing training in World War II. The legacy military R&D put millions of dollars into the valley. Excuse me, billions of dollars. Secrecy limited, as it does, the diffusion of direct technology breakthroughs. But the biggest benefit is the one we never would have figured out. It was the university industry collaborations. It's its most lasting benefit. So that's it. Uh, thank you for your time, um, and uh, hope it was interesting. I'll take uh, any questions if there is, are any. Yes? So it turns out, uh, yeah, thank you. So the question was, how come during the Battle of Britain, the Germans weren't smart enough to shut down the British air defense system called chain home radar? And it turns out that's one of the ironies of the war, that the chain home radar sites uh, were so primitive, they operated at a frequency below what the German um, electronic intelligence uh, systems actually could detect. Um, no, no, no joke, uh, because the Germans, and in post-war, we all asked her, so here, here these guys understood all this stuff. Turned out Chain Home was a very low-frequency radar system. It barely worked, but it, it barely meant it worked. Um, so the British were able to scramble fighters rather than having them orbit all the time um, in, in time to uh, intercept the German bombers uh, during the Blitz. And the Germans never understood the purpose of those tall towers. Um, in fact, there's a long story that there are, the German electronic intelligence uh, uh, system used a Zeppelin pre-World War II uh, breakout to uh, orbit uh, Britain, and the uh, radio receiver they had didn't go down that low. Question? So you mentioned that um, in the Cold War, we injected false planes into the Soviet air defense system. How did we do that without actual planes? Uh, so the question was, how did we inject false signals into the uh, uh, Soviet and, and Col uh, Eastern Bloc uh, uh, radar systems? How did we do that uh, without planes? And so that falls under the, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. Um, um, but uh, the technique is, uh, may or may not be in open literature. You can inject signals. Uh, um, the spoofing stuff was used extensively. Um, uh, even in the first, uh, in the two Gulf Wars used in Vietnam, etc. Other questions? Yes? One of your sites was a list of pilots that were shot down trying to control the Soviet defenses. Why are all the names of the pilots Russian sounds uh, if they're American? So the question is uh, the list of the uh, pilots who were shot down. Um, uh, how come the uh, names were Russian sounding? Uh, the pilots on that list were the names of the Russian pilots who shot down the planes. Uh, uh, when I said this was open source, that list came from the ex-Soviet Union. Um, uh, just, F uh, just to continue that conversation, one of the things we also did, which uh, almost started World War III, is not only did we probe the periphery, uh, pre-U2, we flew electronic intelligence planes all the way across uh, the length and breadth of the Soviet Union. Uh, just to ga gather electronic intelligence. Uh, that's how blind the Strategic Air Command was and how desperate they were to gather this, uh, uh, this data. Other questions? Yes? How much of this system design over to the Soviet campaign? So how much of the question was, how much of this stuff uh, fell into Soviet hands? Um, the Soviet Union had a active, uh, very active, uh, espionage ring in, in the United States and particularly targeted um, uh, one main branch of it uh, at Silicon Valley. And while we all think of the KGB, and that's whose records we actually got access to, uh, one of the more effective groups for espionage was the GRU, uh, which was the uh, uh, Soviet military's intelligence. Uh, targeted uh, almost every defense contractor in Silicon Valley, and that role has now been passed on to the Chinese. Um, other questions? In the back. You talked about uh, gathering intelligence over the Soviet Union. Where was the work being done for protecting the U.S. against Soviet intelligence? Uh, again, so the question was, where was the war being? Uh, where was the work being done to protect the U.S. against? The yeah. So uh, 
One of the things we built in the U.S. was something called SAGE. Uh, and uh, for those of you who haven't been to the Computer History Museum, it was it stood for Semi-Automated Ground Environment, but it was the first automated air defense system, which uh, really was a spectacular piece of hardware and software in the late 50s. It ran for, uh, operationally for about 20 plus years. Probably one of the most sophisticated pieces of uh, integrated uh, man-machine user interface came out with the first uh, light guns and uh, just worth uh, walking next door and taking a look at it in Mountain View. Um, and there were other uh, uh, centers of excellence in the U.S. around Route 128. Um, for those of you who haven't read uh, Annalise Saxinian's book um, called Regional Advantage, until the 70s it wasn't clear that Silicon Valley or Route 128 was going to be the winner um, in um, the center of uh, uh, U.S. innovation. And uh, she posits some very interesting hypotheses about why it happened here rather than there. But around 128, and around Washington, D.C., there were a lot of uh, innovative electronics, uh, military industrial electronics companies. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, and thanks for your time.